Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bob and Linda Bennett. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, again, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want you to think a moment and just think, uh, since this is about to mine, what is the best gift I've ever received? Think about that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> now, a rhetorical question. Was it as small as a mouse or as big as a house? Let me see. How many of you came up with the answer choices? If you did, raise your hand. Uh, I can understand. I understand. How in the heck can choices be a gift? Well, I want you to think about this. The very first and greatest gift that we were ever given, that we ever received, was our own gift of creation as daughters and sons of God. And we were created from love. And then after that creation, our existence, the second greatest gift that God blessed us with was free will. Or in other words, the ability to make choices. So think, if the Creator decided that the greatest gift that they could give us, that God could give us, was existence, and the second greatest gift was the gift of us making choices to choose our own way in our lives, as spirit and now as humans, then wouldn't you agree that the greatest gift that we've ever received is choices? It's that free will thing. So to let you know, if you choose to stick around for the rest of this presentation, Linda and I will share with you how you may use the power of the mind in action to make choices for a happier and healthier way of life. Is that fair? Yeah. First of all, isn't this a fantastic museum? <laughs> this is phenomenal. And for all of us, all of us, uh, Dr. Russell and Leo Russell followers, it's so impressive and it just proves whatever the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. So I want to thank President Matt Presty, your team, and all the people involved in putting this together. I know it was overwhelmingly, uh, I, I don't understand how you did it, but you did it. And I think that we owe you all uh, a round of applause for that. So here Linda and I are, we're in the state of Virginia and what an amazing history this state has. Uh, also for the renowned people that it's known for, people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, Sam Houston, Stephen Austin to name a few. However, the people that we're gonna to touch on today They've not been acknowledged quite as greatly in history and touched on, for they're not warriors or statesmen, they are teachers of the mind. And so the geniuses and mystics that we talk about and that we refer to, I think for that reason, they never had what was called formal education, and I believe that for that reason, that's why they're not taught in school. And that's very, very short-sighted of our educational system. For instance, I learned about Walter Russell while I was studying a near-death experiencer by the name of Mellon Thomas Benedict. Now, I've studied about 2,000 of these people, one of which is right here. And uh, the people that have had, I've studied them to discover what life has for us when it opens that door to the next existence. And I look forward to hearing from PMH Atwater tomorrow uh, this is the third time that Linda and I have had the pleasure of getting to meet and see her again. So studying the Russells has been life enhancing to say the least. And I'm presently on my 11th journey through the home study course on universal law, natural science, and living philosophy. I guess you might say I'm a pretty slow learner, but I really, really want to fully understand their teachings. Now I'm still stymied somewhat by the science, however, we have read all the books uh, that the Russells put out, and many of them more than once. 
So, so Walter and Leo Russell uh, believed that balance was a really important thing, one of God's most important laws. They believed that man-woman balance was essential for having a productive and a loving existence throughout life. And Bob and I have tried to do um, to have that balance even before we were aware of their teachings, but sometimes it's been a challenge, hasn't it, Bob? <laughs> yes, dear. I've learned very well how to maintain balance in the home. Yes, dear. <laughs> so a key principle taught by the Russells was uh, rhythmic balanced interchange, uh, always keeping balance as the main criteria in any, any transactions with other people, and they called that giving for re-giving. Um, if everybody in the world would do that, if they'd stay balanced emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, yes. this, uh, this world would be the heaven on earth that God intended it to be. So maybe someday. The Russells say during the age of character, that's how people did live until somebody decided that a few needed to be in charge and then everything changed. So one caveat that we want uh, to make you aware of in this presentation is that we will be referring to our mother, father, God, our creator, in male terms. You have to pick one. Um, so we'll say he, his, him, and all of us are sons of God. So Matt has told you some things about what we are, and now I'm going to share some things that we are not. We're not biologists, we're not dietitians, we're not therapists, we have no formal training in any medical fields, no psychiatry, no psychology, uh, we don't diagnose any medical conditions, we don't prescribe any medications, we don't propose that we can heal or cure any illnesses or disease. But here's what we have done. We've experienced a lot of stress, learned a lot about that, and we've learned a lot about the mind. And that's what we'll be sharing with you today. So we're going to have some quotes on mind and action here. Uh, mind and thought. Uh, first one being, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. You've already heard that once here. Napoleon Hill wrote that in his book, Think and Grow Rich, in the 1937. A man is but the product of his thoughts. What he thinks, he becomes. Gandhi. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. James Allen. What we think, we become. The Buddha. And Edgar Cayce always said, mind is the builder. When you know your mind is the source of your power, you will command your body to strength and health. Dr. Walter Russell. So we found this and liked these words a lot. Not sure who wrote them, but watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. And again, we're not sure who wrote this, but it seems fitting that um, we should include this because remember, Leo Russell actually founded the International Age of Character Clubs. You know, I was fortunate to choose sales and marketing as a career for 50 years. And to do what Linda and I have done over the past four decades with the businesses that we own, we've always had to stay positive nearly all the time. Otherwise, we would have failed because nobody wants to buy products or services from negative, grouchy people. That's for sure. We started a telecom company in Kansas City, Missouri in 1981 that was built on the principle of rhythmic balanced interchange before we knew anything about rhythmic balanced interchange. We based it on a principle of just do the right thing. And that meant that in every transaction with customers, with associates, with suppliers, it needed to be a win-win situation. That company, although we don't own it anymore, that company is still in existence after all these years. And they've outlasted more than 420 competitors since 1981. 
So the transition to studying teachings of people like the Russells was almost a natural progression for us. And so we want to introduce some of those people that we're using as sources for our presentation. First of all, we're going to start with Walter Russell. Of course, that's why we're here. And you all are familiar with the Leonardo da Vinci of America in the early 1900s. His experience with illumination is exceeded, I believe, only by Jesus and possibly Buddha. Of course, Walter and Leo's work are the reasons that we're here for this grand opening today, and we're very pleased. Leo Russell was also an illuminate, an artist, an entrepreneur, an author, a philosopher. It really is remarkable how much work they, they accomplished in just 15 years of working and living together at Swan and Noah. Mm -hmm. My, she continued the work after his refolding. Uh, she continued it for another 25 years. My favorite book of Leo's is God Will Work With You, But Not For You. Next, we have Edgar Cayce. Edgar was known as the Sleeping Prophet. He founded the Association of Research and Enlightenment Complex in Virginia Beach back in the 30s. And we visited that library also a couple of years ago. Now, the ARE Library has cataloged more than 14,300 of the Cayce readings, and they've made them available to the public. So we've studied the Cayce readings for years, and. We've read over 20 of his books, or books based on his readings. So uh, one especially that deals with what we're talking about today with health is Edgar Casey on Rejuvenation of the Body. And Casey presents four elements of good health and healing, all with balance. First is the assimilation. Assimilation, Casey says that emotions affect the emotions in our mind affect our ability to digest properly and to absorb nutrients. Second is elimination. Bodies and cells must eliminate trash and waste in order to maintain proper health. Third is circulation. Casey thought that the blood was probably the most important thing in the body because it's extremely important for carries food to the cells and trash and waste away from the cells. And fourth is relaxation. We must relax our nervous systems and our physical body in order to heal. Meditation is very, very important. Next, we have Bob Monroe. Bob Monroe was a radio executive with offices on Park Avenue in New York City. He started having out-of-body experiences in the late 50s, about 1958, and he thought maybe he had a brain tumor or something was severely wrong with him. However, he went to a friend of his who was a doctor to, for a thorough checkup, and his friend could find nothing wrong with him and said, Bob, you know, live with it, do what you can. Well, what happened is Bob Monroe gained the ability to go out of body at will at any time, and over the decades, he experienced many dimensions outside of our physical existence. So Monroe published three books, Journeys Out of the Body, which is the classic work on out-of-body experiences. That was in 1992. And then just one year after his death, which took place in 1995 when he refolded, Four Journeys and Ultimate Journey were published in 1996. These books explain that we are way more than just our bodies. Bob also founded the Monroe Institute, located just 16 miles from here, and it's known internationally and provides an opportunity for people to experience other dimensions. I had the pleasure of spending a week there in 2014 attending the inaugural offering of the near-death intensive and I got to say it was a great experience. I also got to meet PMH Atwater there. Dr. David R. Hawkins was an MD and a PhD. He created the largest psychiatric practice in North America in the 1960s. He had a whole wing of a hospital on Long Island and employed a staff of over 50 people. In 1968, he partnered with Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling to write a book called Orthomolecular Psychiatry, which was way ahead of its time. Hawkins used muscle testing, and you, you're probably familiar with muscle testing. That's a way to use your body to see if something is true or false. You can get a yes or no. So he used that muscle testing to develop a map of consciousness, which is um, used by a lot of philosophic writers. 
He was also a contemporary of, and, and a friend of doctors Helen Shuckman and Bill Fetford, who channeled and then wrote A Course in Miracles. And, and by the way, something that we, we learned from David Hawkins is if you ever want to read the books uh, from the A Course in Miracles, start with the daily lessons. You'll, you'll thank me. <laughs> um, Hawkins also authored eight books on his own, uh, Truth Versus Falsehood, Power Versus Force, and Healing and Recovery are just three of those books. Next we have Ernest Shirtliff Holmes. He actually founded the religious science movement, which de derives from the New Thought movement from the uh, 1830s into now. He authored Science of Mind, which includes the subject of mental healing. Holmes wrote numerous books, and he founded the Science of Mind magazine, which has been in constant publication since 1927. And next is Charles Hanel. He's another Missouri boy, just like Bob. He was from St. Louis, Missouri. He published 26 books, which were based on his master key system, which was begun as a correspondence course, and then in, that was in 1912, and in 1916 it was a book. Most of his ideas come from new, the New Thought philosophy, which began in the 1830s and continues into today. Rhonda Byrne, who was the author of the internationally acclaimed book, The Secret, um, patterned the book and the movie of the same name after Hanel's work and also after Earl Nightingale's The Strangest Secret. We have Masaru Emoto. Masaru Emoto experimented with water for years and years and years, and he discovered that water has memory as well as power. And he wrote three books, The Hidden Messages of Water, The Healing Power of Water, and Messages from Water and the Universe. Kelly A. Turner, PhD, wrote the New York Times bestseller, Radical, um, Radical Remission, Surviving Cancer Against All Odds. She wrote that in 2014, and now it's available in 22 languages around the world. Dr. Turner spent eight years traveling through 10 countries studying over 1,500 cases of radical remission of cancer, and she used that as the basis for her book. Next we have Master Chunyi Lin. Master Chunyi Lin studied under a number of Qigong masters in his native China. He immigrated to the United States and settled in Minnesota, developing his own type of Qigong known as Spring Forest Qigong. He amazingly partnered with doctors at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, helping heal cases that sometimes were beyond the abilities offered by Western medicine. Master Lin says that it is not what you do physically with a patient or what you say to a sick or injured person, it's the love that heals them. Dr. Bruce Lipton is a cellular biologist that penned the bestseller Biology of Belief. He was a grad student studying under pioneer researcher Irving Konigsberg right here in Virginia at the University of Virginia. They isolated and then cultivated stem cells in 1967, which was way before the public became aware of stem cells. Um, then he became a tenured professor at the University of Wisconsin Med School, teaching how genes control the body. But his own research refuted what he was having to teach. So he left that tenured profession, or that tenured position, and he uh, went to Stanford to continue additional research. And now he refers to himself as a spiritual cellular biologist as opposed to a scientific cellular biologist. And of course, we have to refer to Jesus when we talk about spirituality. Not only is the Son of God who attained Christ consciousness, but also is the entity said to be channeled by Dr. Helen Shuckman, who along with Bill Thetford, as we previously mentioned, in forming the A Course in Miracles. They started receiving this information from 1961 into the early 70s. And then they compiled 
their writings into a three-volume set of books, a 672-page text, a 485-page workbook of lessons, daily lessons for a year, which that's where you need to start, and then a 96-page teacher's manual, all of which were published in 1977. Now, the doctors didn't wish to receive any remuneration or praise for their work as A Course in Miracles, so they chose to not even have their names put on the books as authors. So these are only nine of the people that we've learned from and that we're referencing as sources in this presentation. At the end, we'll have a slide of a bibliography naming even more sources for the information that we're going to be sharing with you today. So with this presentation, we are wanting to demonstrate the power and use of the mind in action. We start from the very beginning of creation. We'll follow the progression from the inception of God's thought of creation through evolution to why we have a need for healing. And we calculate that should take us about, oh, until Tuesday at 2 o'clock. I don't think we have that much time. Oh, well, we'll have to give you the condensed version, sorry. We'll discuss concepts of the beginning of illness and disease. We'll share some of God's natural processes for healing and maintaining health as physical beings. So we hope that you'll just relax and open your minds uh, to some concepts that might be a little bit different. Uh, we hope you'll benefit from the information that we share this morning, that you'll learn how healing and health really is more in your control and your choices more than you ever dreamed. So we don't believe that the full power of, the, of our creator and of creation is easy for us human beings to comprehend. So when we read about galaxies or stars that are billions and billions of light years away, it's hard to fathom how many trips from Kansas City, Missouri to Waynesboro, Virginia, mm -hmm. that might equal. Uh, you might say it's mind-boggling. Mind -boggling. So what is mind? God's light of love is mind. Wait a minute. Light of mind is love. First of all, God is not an old man with a long white beard sitting on a throne like I thought when I was a little girl. That's true. That's true. My, my mind is the electrical wave generated activating, activating agent providing creative power to spirit. So no appliance can work and do its job until it's plugged in. It's got to have power. And I'm here to tell you that mind is the greatest source of power in existence. God's mind power is love that desires to create. God's thinking is electric waves of balanced light. And God's soul is a recording of every finite experience of all creation. Mind acts as the seed of consciousness and essence of being. And some say that mind is all there is. So God is the great I am. God is all. God is love, giving, universal light of soul. God is sparkling mind of spirit or light. If there was a beginning, it was as an infinite, black, velvety void filled with love or mind. God's mind contemplated what it was, withdrew into itself, into a pinpoint of invisible light to think love and what love was to do. And love manifested desire. And from desire came creation. So mind or love, which we refer to as God, desired to create. And from that pinpoint of invisible light, God created his body. According to the Bible, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, not incandescent light, but light as the basis of created vibrating matter. If there was a Big Bang, this was the genesis of it. And as Russell stated, using light, God, mind, thought, love, desire, power, truth, vibration, geometry, 
mathematics, science, and law as tools to create his electric body. And it was done, and is done, in perfect balance. God created cubes and spheres as the basic forms for building all of creation. God's electric body, the universe, is created by and from God's living light of mind, or love. We are all part of and extended from the oneness of the mind of God. Every vibrating atom and cell of creation are connected through spirit. Now scientists say that life began and grew from one cell to evolve to bodies of trillions of cells. However, science often leaves God out of the equation of creation. Spiritual experts say that bodies of creation remain connected throughout eternity. God's mind created an electric telecommunications. That, that's a slip. That's a Freudian slip. We owned a telecom company for 33 years. It wasn't telecom. It was just an intercommunication system tuned to all idea bodies. Nothing happens without, within a physical body without every cell being aware. As Dr. Russell said, God is within everything, centering it and without everything, controlling it. So God, light, spirit, love, giving, mind are all synonymous terms of oneness. This is a very eloquent slide from Walter Russell. However, don't even go to the trouble of reading it because it's so important to us that we're going to dedicate a slide to each one of the paragraphs. This explanation by Walter Russell simplifies a concept that is very, very difficult to understand when we think only in mortal or finite terms. One of the main keys to healing is recognizing our oneness, especially our oneness with God. God's thinking and imagining creates a body to manifest his soul. That body is the electric wave universe as a whole. It is God's one idea divided by his thinking and imagining into countless million units of ideas, each having a differently formed body, but all manifesting the one by being extensions of each other. So everything in the universe is an idea body because God thought it into physical existence. You are an idea body. Each of us are idea bodies. Every tree, every leaf, every cell within every leaf is an idea body. Every rock is an idea body. There's not else in this vast universe but moving bodies extending from the stillness of the cosmic light of soul, which centers thinking mind of God and man. All formed bodies are made in the image of God and man and extended through mind imaginings to manifest God and man. In other words, everything physical is comprised of moving bodies or atoms. Even in the most still boulder or mountain, the atoms are vibrating. The image of the imaginers doesn't mean the imagined looks like the imaginer, it just means that it is the image of what the imaginer imagines. Easy for me to say, huh? So as Linda said earlier, God doesn't look like a human. He imagines our bodies in the image of humans, and God is invisible, and in reality, as spirits, so are we. So how simple it really is when you think of it that way, creator and creation being just mind imagined forms, electrically extended into electrically formed bodies, fashioned in the images of their imaginers. Again, this doesn't mean that God looks like man or that we as spirit look like man. As humans, we can't see God or the spirit of man. We only see their bodies, which are not really them. So God's body is not God, nor is God his body. Just like your body is not really you, nor are you really your body. The true you is soul spirit, and God is also soul spirit, albeit tremendously more powerful um, and omnipotent, 
Both God and man are invisible to the human eye. Only their bodies are visible. So how much more simple it is to think of the universe as one mind, one soul, one body, seemingly divided into many minds, many souls, and many bodies. This simply means that the visible universe appears to exist. However, it's only a projection from God's mind throughout the void, like a movie being projected onto a screen. Only the projection is multidimensional. Our body is seemingly one thing. However, it's made up and divided into a community of a hundred trillion cells, each as an idea body and each with its own consciousness. You must really learn to think of God and God's body in that way before you can fully understand the oneness of all things. When you do learn to think of it that way, you will know that there are not two separate or separable things in the universe. Likewise, you will fully understand that all things are extensions of each other and the one. So this points out the meaning behind the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which Jesus taught. Or you might have heard what you do to others, you really do to yourself because we're all connected. Our lack of understanding oneness with God is the key contributing factor to sickness and illness. When we feel separated from our creator, our main protector, we become vulnerable to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual toxins. The perfection of God's universe is created with perfect balance, or as the Russell Home Studies course states, rhythmic balanced interchange. So what's amazing is just think that from this infinitesimally small pinpoint of vis visible light that Linda mentioned a while ago, God used the tools that he developed to create the masterpiece body that we call the universe. Russell also mentions the kaleidoscope effect in the home study course. What is the kaleidoscope effect? It is the relationship of cause and effect. So a kaleidoscope uses a couple of mirrors and some broken shards of glass, but then when you add light and movement or vibration, you create thousands of beautiful effects that are constantly changing. That's just like God's body. God uses his tools, music, harmony, geometry, vibration, mathematics, science, system, and balance, and his forms, cubes and spheres, which are comprised of only 118 known elements. And he uses those just like the colored glass in a kaleidoscope to create billions of beautiful effects projected throughout that black velvet void of space. God is cause and his body is the universe of effect. Although we are one, we still live in two universes. We live in the undivided, silent, invisible universe of mind, love, or God. And we also live in the divided, projected, electric universe of matter and motion. The, the invisible universe just can't be seen. So as Russell says, what you see, you cannot know. And what you know, you cannot see. You know the truth, but what you see is an illusion of vibration. But scientists say that the universe, or God's body, is comprised of only 4.9% physical matter, very small percent, but 26.8% dark matter and 68.3% dark energy. But what is dark matter? What is dark energy? They don't really know. It's supposedly what makes up the great empty blackness of space. Thinking logically, the answer is that all is God and extensions of God. Or mind in action. Speaking of the divided, projected universe and dark energy and dark matter, 
In 2004, astronomers pointed the Hubble telescope at a very dark, blank spot for 11 days. Now, this was kind of controversial at the time because of the demands for the use of the telescope and also the cost associated with using the Hubble. The spot that the Hubble observed was about the size of a grain of sand held out at arm's length, and it was close to the constellation Orion, one of the darkest points that scientists ever found in space. Now, the picture here on the left is the computer-generated version of what the Hubble telescope recorded those 11 days. In this ultra-blank, ultra-deep, dark field point, they discovered 10,000 galaxies. And each galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars. So imagine, 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars, all in a point about the size of a grain of sand. So just think, how many points are there like this around the Earth? The enormity of the universe is truly humbling. And again, the only logical answer is that all is God and extensions of God. And the body of God is truly a magnificently infinite structure. God or mind ceaselessly creates in his undivided, quiet universe of stillness. And then God projects his creation through the invisible mirrors just like a kaleidoscope, upon and throughout the endless void of space to create the divided, visible universe of motion and vibration where we are. God is continually reincarnating the divided physical universe of matter and motion. So matter, being temporary, is returned to the undivided universe to rest, to rehabilitate, to revitalize and heal, and to improve, to improve God's desired electric body. So healing and re recreation in this matter is continuous and repetitive at all levels of physical existence. Galaxies would take billions of years to reincarnate. We as humans probably take just an instant, comparatively speaking. Essentially, everything physical is temporary and reincarnates. All existence gives and re-gives back and forth, universe to universe, life to death, death to life. One time, Linda and I were discussing the Russells with Matt and Lori, and we were discussing creation and evolution, you know, just having a little light conversation. But then Matt stated that uh, he preferred combining creation and evolution together, that there's no reason to fight which one was which, and he wanted to form the term crevolution. Well, Linda and I liked that so much that we acquired it as Mark Twain would say, we acquired it artistically. In other words, we stole it in order to use in this presentation. So as God imagined and created his body, he desired companionship, a family. His desire manifested with the creation of the soul, spirit, sons of God. And God's sons were created in his image of invisible perfect light to be co-creators with him. God bestowed free will, have you heard that term before? Free will upon his sons to allow diversity, companionship, and creation. God did not wish to have exact replicas or little godlings thinking or doing the same things that God was. He vowed to never ever interfere with their creative abilities and never interfere with their free will. Now God did, however, hold the right to invoke any of his laws, like the laws of nature or other laws, to correct any imbalance created by his sons. Thus, there is always perfect balance throughout the universe. So with free will, God's children learn by exploring and experiencing God's body, the physical universe of matter and motion. God's mind created time, a tool of measurement, and time was not needed before our physical universe was created. The sons of God spent eons exploring God's body of projected physical matter on space. And many of the sons of God 
began desiring or imagining having their own bodies of created matter. Spirits' desire for their own bodies led many of them to experiment with ex inserting themselves into and out of created matter. You know, like going in and out of rocks or in and out of plants or animals just to get the feel and the experience of physicality. The problem is that we as soul spirit children of God began to use our free will to put ourselves above all else. And through our selfishness and our desire to create our own bodies and lives, we spent too much time in our experimental bodies. And the more spirit experimented with inhabiting physical matter, the more we became addicted to this physicality. And these experiments resulted in us sons forgetting our spiritual heritage, and we became trapped within our own physical bodies of matter. We became prisoners of material bodies due to our physical desires, our emotions, senses, experiences. We were trapped. And after eons of time of continual entrapment, sons of God devolved into homo sapiens, also known as us humans. This devolution from pure spirit to homo sapien bodies coincides with the evolution from one cell entities to bipeds like apes to Cro-Magnon man to homo sapiens. And this forgetting of our spiritual connection to God and embracing physicality has been referred to by many philosophers and religions as the separation. We began thinking that we were our bodies. However, in order to exist and survive, man's bodies had to create symbiotic relationships with various organisms such as microbes, bacteria, viruses, parasites, etc. And without these relationships, man's bodies would not exist. To maintain proper functioning, all idea bodies must vibrate in harmony to maintain the proper balance. And these symbiotics vibrated at various frequencies to help keep our bodies in balance. So when balance is lost, negative effects then result in the form of illness or disease or varying degrees. The symbiotic relationships created among these entities ensures our balance. And to maintain a body's balance, all of us must be vibrating at our proper frequencies. Now, scientists estimate that 57% of the cells in our body are not even human. They also say that 30% of our body weight is not human. So this explanation makes it clear that what Matt was saying when we had that discussion that day, that he was correct about there not being an argument between creation and evolution. So it should be referred to as revolution. By the way, don't even Google it. I've tried numerous times and I keep getting revolution, so. We pay a drastic price while being separated. We seriously alter our abilities. Uh, as spirit, there are no sensory uh, limitations. As, but as man, we are tremendously limited. As spirit, we have unlimited multi-directional sight uh, seen in all directions at the same time and all distances. But as humans, we see less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum. You could just compare that to like an eagle can see a mouse in a field from a thousand feet in the sky. Uh, I need readers to read a book. So even our sense of smell is derelict compared to a dog or a bear. A dog can track humans or other animals just through scent, and a bear can smell food 18 miles away. As humans, we hear less than 1% of the acoustic spectrum, and we cannot hear the music of the spheres. We're weighed down by the mass of our bodies. As spirit, we're able to be at any point in the universe just using thought. But as physical beings, we are subject to mass pressures upon our bodies, 
which are created by environmental and differing potentials. It, they're the same potentials that caused Newton's apple to fall to the earth. Man lost awareness of the body that we had created it was really a temple housing our spirit and our connection to mind. Our bodies became more important than our spirit, our true selves. So without the balance of God within us and knowledge of spirit within us, our material bodies became vulnerable. Yeah, our bodies are temples to house our spirit and life force to mental, to mind. Not knowing a connection to a protective power, we developed some emotions, one being fear. The emotion of fear vibrates at frequencies that are very damaging, can be damaging to mind and body. Prior to the separation, there was no need for healing. As spirit, the children of God were created perfect and always were in balance. Therefore, with perfection, there's no negative Ill influence like sickness or illness. And after se the separation, electrical potentials start affecting man's physical body, creating many types of stress. Separation from God's balance is a direct cause of human illness and disease. Edgar Cayce says, quote, the only cause of illness or disease is the toxemia of unbalance. So this is true for when we don't know the balance of God within us, we're weakened. So separated man desired a superior force to protect himself. And so we created an unreal protector and guide to the world, which we call the ego. That unreal protector, that ego, embraces its fear-laden power over our body and our senses and mind. The ego desires to completely rule the body, mind, and spirit. However, man's body is a slave to the ego and the five senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch, but think of how flawed the ego and the five senses truly are. For example, we can be completely fooled by illusory, fake magic and things like card tricks, as well as optical illusions like railroad tracks that meet on the horizon. Our senses are very, very limited, while our spirit is not. There's only one mind, however, due to desire, the separation and the physical and sensory influences, man created stratified aspects of mind. These aspects are created, that uh, we created the conscious, the subconscious, and the superconscious. Now, according to science, the brain processing power is 13% conscious and a whopping 87% subconscious. The superconscious is that invisible connection to spirit. Our conscious mind is not very powerful, and in computer language, it leaves a lot to be desired. For instance, it operates only at about 2,000 bits per second, and it controls our existence about 2 to 6% of the time. While the subconscious aspect of our mind operates at an approximate 400 million bits per second, and controls our existence 94 to 98% of the time. That's why when you drove here, you didn't remember every time you stepped on the brake or every time you turned because you were being controlled by your subconscious mind. You were in a trance. It's cognizant of everything that goes on in and around us and the power of the subconscious aspect 200,000 times that of the conscious mind. It drives the bus that we're on. The superconscious aspect is the direct connection, as Linda said, to God through spirit. However, most of the time, our choices don't vibrate at the frequency that keeps us connected to spirit. Man's body is a temporary repeating domicile for mind and spirit due to reincarnation. Each time we incarnate, our minds are pretty much white clean so we can learn everything that we need to learn. Sometimes some people do retain uh, co connections with previous lives. From the time we are in utero until about age seven, 
our mind operates the brain in theta brain state. And in theta, we are like sponges. We just absorb everything, all of our experiences, and uh, from all of the environments that we also experience. The environments are the, our family, our relatives, their friends, school, TV, everything that happens to us, whether it's positive or uh, negative. Our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual environments influence our lives greatly. Our thoughts and experiences create known and unknown memories and programs. And within these programs, we store patterns, images, visualizations, sounds, smells, everything that our senses detect. We store these factors in the subconscious aspect of our mind. And these programs do good or bad. They control our lives from their inception pretty much for our life. For instance, a program could be created as simply as a young child that goes to the store with a parent. Now possibly the child had done something earlier in the day that upset the parent. And when they get to the store, the little child sees a candy bar and says, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, can I have a candy bar? And the response from a scowling parent is, No, no, you don't deserve it. Now, some kids don't even give this experience a second thought. However, others very hurtfully will think, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. And it creates that program within them. And even though the, kid, the kid's conscious mind may forget about it quickly, the subconscious never forgets. And possibly, frequently, throughout the kid's life, when they really want something, that program will kick in and it'll play. And subconsciously, they'll think, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve a good grade. I don't deserve a good job. I don't deserve a happy relationship. I don't deserve to be healthy. And it sets a pattern for life, and not a good pattern. However, think, though, good patterns are also set in the same way with good positive experiences. So during our first seven years, we've not learned how to discern what's true from what's false. And everything we experience has potential to create or add to these programs within our subconscious mind. About age seven, though, we create a gatekeeper. And this is a gatekeeper that protects our subconscious programs that we've created through those first seven years. And it protects those positive and negative programs. So this gatekeeper prevents new programs from conflicting with the ones that are already in our subconscious. And the gatekeeper is really good at that job. And it allows those embedded subconscious programs to just run free, and we, that's how we live our lives. And when we attempt to use the conscious mind to change programs in the subconscious mind, it rarely, if ever, works because the subconscious is so much more powerful than the conscious. So if your program says, everybody in my family is fat, so I'm supposed to be fat, that's why diets don't work. And you may even lose weight. But sometime, somewhere, that subconscious program is going to kick in again and you gain the, all of the weight back and sometimes even more. In order to change those programs, you, you, you have to go in and learn how to release and let them go in order to create a new program. So the gatekeeper, the ego, senses together dictate how we function in life. And gaining the ability to influence that gatekeeper, as Linda said, is very, very difficult due to the differential in power. And the more we create balance in these programs, the greater our life will be rewarded. Although these programs or patterns are very much embedded and control most of our lives, there are some very effective techniques for rewriting and reprogramming those embedded programs. And Linda and I have spent years learning many of these techniques, and we've seen them change people tremendously for the better. And what is great is that these techniques work at the speed of thought. Thus, the name of our practice changes at light speed. 
Man's body is a battleground where the ego, which is fear, battles the spirit, which is love. And the ego is aware of the spirit, but the spirit doesn't recognize anything that isn't real or eternal, so the spirit doesn't recognize the ego. The creator recognizes us as spirit and constantly communicates with us who and what we are. However, we're so consumed, consumed with our physicality that we often don't tune in to that frequency. If we consistently do go within and decentrate, like the Russells describe, and we quietly listen, we will hear God's silent voice and learn who we truly are, a spiritual son of God. Now, as Illuminates, the Russells, as you know, mastered that ability to maintain the awareness of God all the time. And they stated that they were constantly contemplating God being with them and everything they created, they created with God's hands. And we can all learn how to do that too. And this museum is a testament to that for Walter Russell. When we're truly communicating with God, we can know the following. Man, as an extension of God, is creator of his electric body. Man is light and God to the extent of his knowing as such. Man is mind to the extent of his knowing he is mind. And man is master of his body to the extent of his knowing light of God within him. Man may have all knowing and all power when he is ready and desires such. Now the only source preventing these realities is the ego and its power of fear. To know God, we know ourselves as mind. To know ego, we know ourselves as body. The brain is not the mind, and the mind is not in the brain. The mind uses the brain as a switchboard to send messages to the body. Only the mind can create. The body is simply a learning tool. As previous, previously stated, there is only one mind and it encompasses all. Nothing in the universe moves unless mind tells it to. It moves because of unequal pressures. The mind is universal and connected with and part of our creator, but it doesn't override our free will. Free will of mind also creates unequal pressures. God does not override his son's free will. However, God does stay connected to spirit and man through the Holy Spirit. Remember the intercommunication system that Linda talked about earlier? Well, God talks to his trapped children constantly by whispering in a small, still, silent voice through the channel of the Holy Spirit. God's voice manifests communications as what I refer to as the five eyes, instinct, intuition, inspiration, imagination, and illumination. Realize that these are not physical communications, but spiritual communications that vibrate at frequencies not tuned to that of physicality, but to thought. So for instance, do you hear the music? You don't unless you tune it in to the right station. And only then, when you tune to God's frequency, are you able to receive the messages. Man desired enhanced sensory experiences. So we used our mind and senses to create emotions. Emotions are mental and physical reactions to an object, a happening, a person, an, a, an event. Of course, we also know emotions are feelings, moods, sentiments. Emotions develop from our ancestors' interactions with their environments. And those inter interactions involved everything from sitting by a peaceful stream in nature to running away from a scary saber-toothed tiger to save your life. So some, body, some books list as many as 440 negative emotions, but they only list 297 emotions that are mm. positive. In fight or flight, in the fight or flight response, which is based on fear, 
it causes over 1,400 reactions in the body. Uh, this includes the re release of cortisol, which is referred to as the stress hormone. Now, cortisol is a good hormone unless it is released too often or for too long, and then it becomes toxic. Now, conversely, joy and euphoria, which also create 1,400 chemical reactions in our bodies, they, re um, they release positive emotions um, like Hap, uh, the happiness hormones of dopamine and serotonin. So the reason we're talking about emotions is because emotions affect health on a continual basis. Negative emotions especially exacerbate sickness and even injury. So there are only true, two true human emotions, and those are love and fear. This is according to A Course in Miracles. All other emotions are derivatives of those two main emotions. So love and fear are the bookends of the whole emotional spectrum. Now derivatives of love are positive and healing, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Derivatives of fear create negative effects and are toxic to the body and mind. These toxic effects create mental fears physical diseases, and emotional traumas. Emotions trigger glandular activity within the body, like the cortisol end dimension. Now, unlike man, animals, which does not really carry a human-like consciousness, they experience fear when a predator is chasing them. However, after the chase is over, they're either eaten, or if they escape, they just simply shiver and release the fear from the trauma. When they're no longer threatened, they release it and let it go. Man, on the other hand, dwells on what could have happened. Oh, I could have been killed. I could have been maimed. I could have done, I could. And they keep the fear dwelling within them, continuing to release these fear hormones and damaging the body with fearful, caustic thoughts that become toxic to the body. So realize that Love and fear cannot exist in the mind simultaneously. It's a physiological impossibility. So with free will, we can choose which emotions drive our consciousness if we really desire to. Here's a bodily map of emotions. There was a group of departments from two universities in Finland that did research on how emotions affect the body. And they processed PET scans of people who were in differing emotional states. Now these pictures show how varying emotions derived from love and fear light up the cells, tissues, and organs throughout the body. Researchers refer to these as suppressed or trapped emotions sometimes. Many studies have discovered when the conscious mind becomes overwhelmed with negative or even positive emotions, they must shunt them off in some direction, so they shunt them to the various tissues throughout the body, different parts. These emotions are the ones that the conscious mind can't process thoroughly or effectively, and that's why the body winds up absorbing them. However, when these emotions are properly processed and released using various methods and techniques, like energy psychology, Balance can be restored to the body, and healing is what usually takes place. So derivative emotions that are out of balance create negative effects, like fear, anger, hatred, frustration, overall stress. And these are toxic and cause the endocrine system glands to release stress hormones, which can result in any of these multiple things, brain cell death, increased aging, all these negative things can occur. God's ecstasy of love. We humans often let emotions, ego, and senses rule our bodies, as said before. We believe that what applies to us also applies to God. We try to make God and man's image. And in error, man has tried to attach human emotions like anger, vengeance, wrath, and more to God. But to God, human emotions are unreal and do not even exist. So God's only emotion 
is the ecstasy of love. Love is creation and is true, real, infinite, immortal, and it is the ultimate emotional goal of all humanity as desired by our Father God. Father, Mother, pardon me. <laughs> Fear, which is the opposite of love, is unreal, temporary, destructive, and creates unbalance. Stress is the result of any mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual unbalance. The American Institute of Stress, I'm sorry we have to have an Institute of Stress, but anyway, they have a lot of statistics about stress. 77% of people regularly experience negative physical results due to stress. And 73% get psychological symptoms. They estimate that up to 90% of all doctor's visits are due to stress. They also estimate that stress costs the United States like $300 billion a year in health care and missed work. All of man's ills are due to lack of knowing God's balance within him. Illness and disease are created by not keeping body functions balanced, as mentioned earlier. Negative visualizations, images, unhealthy beliefs, and damaging memories create toxins and unbalance. And all of these, guess what? They're mind choices. Toxins and unbalance are a result of negative effects of wrong thinking. Now, wrong-mindedness or wrong thinking is listening to and following the ego and the senses. There's something called the quinine mind. Back when the Panama Canal was being erected, hundreds of people died from malaria, maybe thousands. And studies found that many people who acquired malaria could be healed only with quinine, nothing else. Like the blind man in the Bible, where Jesus mixed his spit with dirt and rubbed it on the man's eyes to cure his blindness. Jesus did that because he knew the man's belief system and he knew the man could not be healed in any other way. In John 16, 12, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. So man at the same time was just not consciously advanced enough to understand what Jesus wanted to teach them. So at all times, toxic microbes, bacteria, viruses, and parasites inhabit and surround our bodies. However, we don't get sick all the time, do we? It's only when we get too far out of balance, and that unbalance could be in attitude, in nourishment, in exercise or lack of it, rest and sleep, uh, belief system, emotions, and spirituality can all unleash negative effects of these threats and, and cause sickness, disease, even injury. Sickness and disease are mind-created from the toxemia of unbalance. Disease is mentally contagious through suggestion. If everybody else in the office is getting sick, oh, then I'm gonna get sick too. What the mind conceives and believes it can achieve. And this statement is for good and bad. For instance, in Dr. Lissa Rankin's book, Mind Over Medicine, she explained how so many new doctors start experiencing the same illnesses that they're treating their patients for. She states when she quit medicine, she was being treated for three terminal conditions. After she'd been away from medicine for a couple of years, those conditions all but one just faded away. She relates uh, that it was because of the stress of being a doctor. However, remember we can choose to have stress or not. Um, it is part of that free will. Bob and I have had clients that heard about a disease or had known somebody who had a disease and then they got scared that they might get it and they worried about it and they re researched it and they got, spent hours on the internet and guess what? They got it. The mind is um, very, very powerful in negative and positive ways. So we have root causes of sickness, steps to healing. Of course, the first thing mentioned is the belief in the separation from God. 
And one step to heal that is very simply accept the fact that we are physical, but we have a spiritual balance within us. Feeling the lack of love. Most all of us never get loved the way we want to be loved. Even though others love us, they don't do it exactly the same way that we want to be loved. So instead of worrying about what we're getting, why don't we just give love out? Because you can't run out of love. It is infinite. Love for regiving. Belief in fear, any fear, is detrimental to your health and well-being. So what you do is accept the fact that you have divine power within you. And guess what? Divine power represents love. Where love exists, fear can't. Next, we have the inability to forgive another. Well, it is tough to forgive somebody that's really hurt you. So what you want to do, forgive their spirit because their spirit is perfect just like your spirit is perfect. And don't even consider what they did to you as being forgivable. Just release it and let it go. And you'll see how freeing that can be for yourself. Emotions derived from fear. Best thing to do, think of right-mindedness. Again, you have a choice. You can choose fear, you can choose love. Love heals, fear makes you ill. Physical, mental, and spiritual toxins. Use the power of the mind and the body appropriately. Use proper diet. You know, you, for the physical aspect, use proper diet. Get rest. But also for the mind, make the proper choices and think with right-mindedness. Now, I realize these steps are easy to say, but they are more difficult to do. They may require guidance and help because often it's easier for someone on the outside to see your patterns and your programs than it is for us to see them ourselves. The healing principle is within man himself. Man's power to heal himself or extend his healing power to others is measured by his awareness of God in him from the message of the divine Iliad. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the placebo effect it is the mind and body's great ability to heal. Placebo accounts for approximately 30% to as much as 90% of healings. Most placebo studies center around using a, a, a sugar pill. One study found that a pure white sugar pill creates healings of 30%. 30% effective in healing. Other studies proved that when you add a letter to the pill, or maybe you change the color, or change the shape of it, or even change the method of delivery, and, and instead of a pill, you're do, using an injection, the effectiveness of the placebo can go up to 90%. There have also been four research studies over the last decade in which orthopedic surgeons performed sham placebo arthroscopic surgeries on patients with damaged knees. And what they did is they would have a, a monitor so that the patient could see, watch their operation because those types of operations are done when they're awake and they just use a local anesthetic. So the patient is all prepared and they're draped so they can't see their own legs. They just watch their operation on the monitor. And they were given local anesthetics. What they didn't know was they weren't watching anything happening to themselves. They were watching somebody else's operation. And all they got was the incision and nothing else was done. And the results were that those people who got the sham operations healed as fast or even more quickly than the people who got the real operations. And even more importantly, they had no ongoing knee pain. The mind is very powerful. The mind believes the police placebo is effective and powerful, and so it becomes effective and powerful. Now, you may not have heard of the nocebo effect. It's just the opposite of the placebo. And what the nocebo says is, if you believe that you cannot heal, then no matter what, medicine, no matter what doctor you go to, no matter what procedure you have, you probably won't heal. 
the nocebo effect is as effective as placebo. Then Dr. Bruce Lipton also says, quote, a negative thought is equally as powerful in controlling our health as a positive one. However, it is in the opposite direction. Nothing really can heal permanently but right thinking, says Ernest Shirtleff Holmes. There's a state of consciousness that can heal, says Edgar Cayce. The art of healing comes from nature, not from the physician. Therefore, the physician must start from nature with an open mind, Paracelsus. All illness is physical, mental, and spiritual, and therefore it's best to utilize all modalities to assist recovery, Dr. David R. Hawkins. And of course, Jesus said, thy faith hath made thee whole. As stated before, all healing comes from within. Now we mentioned wrong-mindedness and right-mindedness earlier. Healing is definitely where thinking right aids in the preventative and healing process. You see, a balanced body tremendously decreases the opportunity for illness as well as energy. Proper attitude, diet, exercise, both physical and mental, meditation, rest, will heal your body, mind, and spirit. So get your belief systems right, and you will be right. Physical traumas and injuries also heal according to the state of mind. You see, if you're in a fearful state of mind, if you're afraid of the disease that you've got, you will not hear, heal nearly as quickly nor thoroughly as you would while being in a loving state of mind. After all, if you have this illness, it's something you've created, so why not love it? Right-mindedness listens to the Holy Spirit, forgives and induces healing. Natural healing energies or frequencies are within us, around us, and are always available to us if we choose to employ loving attitudes. All healing of every nature is by changing the vibration from within. And everything vibrates at precise frequencies, and when we get off frequency, we get unbalanced. Attuning the atomic structure or matter to the spiritual divine within heals. It's worth mentioning that again. The placebo effect is an inherent power within us that heals from within. Scientists don't know, they don't understand the placebo effect and how it functions. We believe that it is the divine capacity for healing provided by spirit centering with us from within. The more we believe in a placebo, whether that is a, a real medicine, a, a, an herb, a procedure, a doctor, a hospital, the more we believe, the more powerful and the more uh, effective it is in healing. The more we change fearful thoughts to loving thoughts, the greater our health improves. Love may be the placebo. So let's look more about how the mind brings about healing. Well, just as God renews his body, the universe, man's mind also cycles and renews his physical body. For instance, more than 93% of your body is replaced every year. Now, Edgar Cayce states in his readings that physically, you are never more than seven years old, meaning that every cell in your body has been replaced within seven years. And God will work with you, but not for you. Leo Russell states, not one particle of you is older than one seven hundred billionth of a second. Now, 72% of our bodies is water, and it's replaced every 16 days. Skin cells are replaced every four weeks. The lining in the stomach and intestines every four to five days. The liver is replaced every six weeks. The heart cells are replaced every six months. So you see how temporary we are? Life and death takes place simultaneously, second by second within our bodies, from birth throughout life. Now the natural divine power within us that is centering us, centering our body, it repairs, removes, and replaces millions of cells every second. That's billions every hour. 
On average, we eliminate one to two pounds of dead and dying cells per day through our breathing, sweating, excretion, and all of our forms of elimination. If we didn't do this, the refuse would become toxic and kill us. Now, many times you can experience this by weighing yourself at night, right at bedtime, and then again first thing in the morning when you get up and notice the difference. You know, if I didn't have this ability to rid myself of all these dying cells and refuse and such, and I just kept adding cells throughout my life, at my age, I'd weigh 23 tons, and I'd smell pretty bad. So speaking of our bodies being 72% water brings us to Masaru Emoto and his research about how water is affected by environment. Memory is the faculty of the human mind by which information is encoded, stored, and retrieved, and it was discovered years ago that water also has memory. Scientists have proven that. And if you look at that first picture, that's um, a picture of a water crystal that was taken from the Fujiwara Dam area in Japan. And it has no balance, no real form, no real shape. The second picture is from the same area in the Fujiwara Dam area in Japan, but the difference is it was prayed over by a priest. And look how balanced, how beautiful, how crystalline in nature it is by comparison. So our bodies are 72% water. We've said that before. So it appears that Mr. Emoto's, as well as other people's research, presents the reasonable assumption that we might be able to treat the water within our bodies with energy and uplifting prayer, and as a result, have healing results. Uh, realizing that water has properties of memory and the ability to respond to environment, we can consider Dr. Bruce Lipton's concept. From his book, Biolo Biology of Belief, he talks about our spiritual, mental, emotional environments dictate to our cells how they should react. In other words, our thoughts, our attitudes, and not our genes control our physical makeup and life status. And he has done the research to prove that. Only a very small percent is in control of, uh, controlled by the genes. Dr. Lipton says it's less than 5% of heredity that really affects our health. This is a picture of Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut and founder of the uh, International Organization of Noetic Sciences. He founded it in 1973. Now, one of the subjects that IONS decided to study thoroughly was spontaneous remission or spontaneous and thorough healing from life-threatening illnesses and diseases. In 1999, IONS released a bi bibliography of 3,500 plus experiences that all of a sudden they've been given up on. These patients have been deserted by the medical community, told they just go home and die. They were declared incurable and essentially given a death sentence. But when the patient released their illness to the divine, they balanced mind, body, spirit, and they had a spontaneous remission. So how did these patients recover? Well, there are many different stories. However, the most consistent was that they chose just to let go and let God. They allowed the divine within them to become first, and it wound up saving their lives. Just letting go of negative influences helped them to heal. Norman Cousins was the editor-in-chief of the Saturday Evening Post from 1942 to 1972. He was known internationally and won a lot of awards for his writing and other accomplishments. He took a trip to Russia in 1964, and after that, he developed ankylosing spondylitis, which was considered to be a an incurable disease by the medical profession. The, the doctors told him that he would die within months. And they gave up on him. So, but he discovered that when friends came to visit him and they got him to laughing, then he could sleep for an hour or two. All the rest of the time he couldn't sleep because he was in such extreme pain. So he checked himself out of the hospital and into a hotel 
across the street. And every day he was watching movies, funny movies, especially, especially Laurel and Hardy, he liked that. And he laughed every day a lot. Well, he also took extremely high doses of vitamin C, which was recommended and researched by Linus Pauling. In six months, he was back on his feet. In two years, he was back to um, work full time. And not only did he get back on his feet, but he was also playing tennis. And the doctors had told him that he, had nev he could never play that again. So Norman Cousins also wrote a book called Anatomy of an Illness to talk about his experience. And this became a movie too. Ed Asner played it, played Norman Cousins. This is Lester Levinson. Lester was actually known for being a very brilliant person, was considered so by his uh, academic achievements. He was a physicist and an electrical engineer. In 1952, <laughs> at the age of 42, Lester had his second major heart attack. He was told by his doctors, Lester, go home, rest. Don't do anything. Don't even bend over to tie your shoes. Get you some slip-on shoes because bending over to tie your shoe could kill you. He was told that he could die any moment, but the doctors relented and they gave him a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so. They were really nice. Lester went home very distraught, started thinking, how in the heck had I created this terrible problem with my health? So after analyzing his situation, he found that when he felt that he wasn't loved or in a loving mode himself, he felt bad. But when he felt loving and he felt loved by others, he felt good. So he was still alive a few weeks later. And he decided he had nothing to do, nothing to lose. So he started researching his memory for all the times that he felt bad. And then he used forgiveness and love to erase and release all the negative feelings generated by those bad memories, those are negative emotions. From this process, Lester created what's called the Sedona Method, also known as the release technique. And when you properly apply this technique, it helps you release all negative emotions associated with memories and feelings. And when the mind and body becomes balanced in this manner, then the result is healing and longevity. Well, Lester never went back to the doctors again. When he refolded, he was a very happy and wealthy 84-year-old man. We talked about Dr. David R. Hawkins before. He lived a lifestyle of atheism until his 30s. He experienced a lot of chronic illnesses and many diseases and hospitalizations through his life. He acquired some of those illnesses when he was in med school and they lasted for years. And some of his conditions were obesity, allergies, migraines, ulcers, hypoglycemia, diverticulitis, gout, tumors, Graves' disease, extreme poison ivy sensitivity that took him to the hospital twice, fragrance sensitivities, and a lot more. So he started studying A Course in Miracles. You know, he muscle tested it to make sure that it was true. And after accepting those principles of A Course in Miracles, he re realized that his diseases were a result of his belief systems. So he made a conscious decision to cancel his old belief systems about his illnesses and, and negative conditions and change those. Some of his illnesses were eliminated within hours. Some took days, some months. The one that took the longest was the um, hypoglycemia, which took two years for him to release. In Dr. Kelly Turner's book uh, about healing cancer called Radical Remission, she states that there are really 75 factors that the people that she researched used to get rid of their cancer. We're not giving you all 75 of them, but we'll give you the nine um, that were the most important. And those people that she studied did all of these nine things and more. Dr. Kelly's book was published in 2014. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for quite some time. And now it is um, accepted by a lot of people as the definitive book on cancer remission and healing. Okay, I'd like to talk to you now about a personal healing experience 
Uh, Linda and I were at a training and a master practitioner from Ireland was there relating her experience after develop, developing lymphoma. And she was scared to death. She was not completely healed and she was looking for guidance. She had gone the Western route with medicine and had surgery, radiation, chemo, and was still scared to death and seeking advice. And I became a little bit judgmental about her and I thought, well, why don't you just heal the cancer yourself? You're a master practitioner, you know what created it, you can heal it. And I thought, if I ever got something like that, I'd heal it myself and use it as an example of the power of the mind to heal. Because I knew the mind was powerful, but I don't think I realized it was quite as powerful at the time. It was if my mind, some aspect of it thought, Bob, you're really great at talking the talk. Let's see how good you are at walking the walk. So in about September of 2015, I noticed a red spot on my right temple. The next two slides are gonna be somewhat graphic, but I noticed the red spot on my right temple. Now this actually is a picture from 2011, which means that that red spot was there even then. So it takes cancer a good while to really overtake your body, unless you succumb to eating sugar and fear, and then you, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. So my subconscious thought, get cancer, and so it did. All of a sudden I knew that I had cancer. This red spot started growing, and it grew to the point, I thought, well, I think I know what it is, so I'll be able to heal it. Give me six months and I'll have it healed. Well, it got a little bit worse. And I had these tumors, this big open wound on the side of my head. But I decided I was not going to use any type of medical help. I went to a doctor, went to a naturopath. She gave me some enzymes, but she said she was gonna to have to refer me to a dermatologist. And I was not gonna to go to that route. So I decided to use all natural goods. So I got some black salve from Ecuador, and notice the white stuff in the salve? Those are the cancer cells that are being pulled out of the wound. So a year later, I've still got this open wound, and I'm going, now wait a minute, I love this, I've loved it, I've released it, why isn't it gone? And one day I was meditating, and the thought came to me, well, you're trying to do it all on your own. I thought, whoa, hmm, that's kind of interesting. So I started shuffling through my stuff and I found an old prayer that I had and I adapted it for this experience and I started repeating that prayer to myself daily three four five ten fifteen twenty times a day and I visualized what I was saying in the prayer and in three weeks that's September the second I'd reduced the wound down to this it went on dried up and healed. And that proved to me the power of the mind and the ability for us to heal ourselves if we don't invoke fear or wrong thinking. So what I'd like to do now, this was, a, a, was an example of my own healing but I want to demonstrate to you all that you have the power also of mind over body, okay? I want everybody to take your hands, look at them like this, and if you look at the bottom of your palms, there are creases or lines. If you kind of fold them, you can see the lines. I want you to take those creases and match them together, put them together at the wrist, and slowly bring your fingers up into a prayer mode and look at the tips of your middle fingers. Okay, they're fairly even, might be a little bit off, right? Okay, now separate your hands. Let's get a second opinion on this. Go back, put those lines together, bring them up. Are they about the same? Okay, pretty much the same. Now I want you to take one of your hands, put it down to your side, take the other hand, put it above your head. And I want you to close your eyes and visualize your hand growing. Okay, repeat after me. I feel my hand growing. I can feel the tingling. I, can feel, I, can I feel, feel the, the power of the mind I over my body. The power of the mind I can feel, feel it vibrating. 
can feel, I can it, feel it, and I know that it's extending. I can feel it. And larger it's and larger. larger and that larger. That finger is growing. Finger okay. Is growing. Now, open your eyes, bring your wrist back down, put those creases together, and bring your fingers up, and see what naturally happens. How many of you? How many people grew their fingers? All right. And for those that didn't, don't worry about it, because sometimes we let other stuff get in our minds. But it just proves to you the power of your mind over your body. So the same thing happens. It comes down to choices, whatever we choose to do. Thank you all for participating. I hope that that was beneficial. In summary, we're going to just quickly go over what we talked about. Mind is God, light, love, as oneness created the universe as his body. God created soul, spirit, sons as companions and gave them free will. Sons of God desired physicality and used God's idea bodies to become man. Prolonged time in the chosen idea bodies caused the separation from God. And separation caused fear as the opposite of love. And from fear, man created ego. Ego as replacement for God causes negative effects in man's lives. God is mind and love and not his body. Man is mine and not his body. Man must realize he is mind and spirit in order to return to God as one. Man's destination is to return to God as the perfect son and companion. We began this life journey from first breath as separated sons of God. Our thoughts and choices create our lives, not our genes or our heredity. And with free will, we choose either love or fear. And in this life form, all healing comes from within. Our choices determine if we're moving toward or away from our creator. Knowing ourselves as mind and love returns us to the creator. And to return to God within, we must also learn to think of God, but we have to do it on a constant, regular basis. So sometimes I tell people just with every breath, remember that you are God and part of God. And here's a quote by Dr. Wayne Dyer that I really like. Heaven on earth is a choice you must make, not a place you must find. So here's the bibliography of some of the other sources that we've uh, utilized in putting this together. And so from us, we hope you have good health and good healing. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.